has those things going towards it, then we're on. Gotcha. And when it's not green, then it's muted. Got it. Yeah. Learning, learning. Green means go. Love it. Although the red is recording, so I don't I have to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my clock says 9 a.m. So, um, what does yours? Is anybody yep. else at 9? Mm -hmm. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, I want to thank my Antoinette, and I want to thank Rob Williams, who is here remotely today, uh, and uh, Holly Muggenberg and our office, who have set this up. And <laughs> uh, most importantly, I want to thank Brown Winnick and the entire advisory council. ABI about six years ago created a council of members uh, whose sole purpose is to identify issues facing our members and then work together to solve those problems and challenges. And uh, employment law is something that is consistently at the top of the list of challenges facing our members. And so today, uh, Danny Smid with Brown Winnick is here to help us with that. And I think I'll go ahead and uh, introduce you to Danny right now. Daniel Dixon Smid is a member of Brown Winnick and is actively involved in the firm's employment, business, and corporate securities and renewable fuels practice areas. Danielle's employment practice includes counseling employers on hiring, discipline, termination, drug testing, discrimination, and harassment issues, compensation, union avoidance and personnel policies. Danielle conducts management and personnel training concerning personnel issues and has served as an investigator for clients regarding discrimination and harassment allegations. Danielle has appeared in front of numerous administrative agencies such as Iowa Workforce Development and Iowa Civil Rights Commission as well as state and federal courts on behalf of clients. In addition, Danielle has represented clients in employment related mediations and arbitrations Danielle is a frequent speaker on employment-related issues for clients, human resources, and other professionals, and has written several articles in regard to the same. Danielle received her BS from Iowa State University in 1995, woo <laughs> and her JD with honors from Drake University in 1998. She was admitted to the bar in Iowa, uh, United States District Courts for the Northern and Southern Districts of Iowa, and the United States Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1998. She is a member of the Iowa State American Member and Business Law Section and Labor Employment Section and the Polk County Bar Association. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Danny, who is going to talk about what the new ABAAA regulations mean for your business. Oh, and please, by the way, there is a box just underneath the PowerPoint presentation, and that's where you can insert your questions as we go, and uh, we'll try to get those addressed uh, as they come up. So, thanks for being here today. All right, ready to get started. Hopefully you all have your breakfast and your coffee and your caffeine that you need to get ready to go today. Um, we're going to talk today, like Lisa said, about the uh, new ADAA regulations. Um, as most of you know, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, was amended. Um, that resulted in the new ADAA. Um, recently, back in March, the EU, EEOC, a lot of letters, um, came out with their new regulations basically um, indicating how um, courts are to interpret the new ADAAA. So that's what we're going to go through today. Um, like Lisa said, if you have questions, please feel free to talk, type them in. We will try to, I'll try to pay attention and um, get them answered as we go. If not, we'll get them at the end for sure. And so we'll see if we can get through this. There we go. Just a little bit of a, a historical overview. Um, most of you, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with the, the original ADA, the Americans with Disability Act. It was passed and signed into law in 1990. Um, basically, in the midst of the AIDS crisis, they decided that they needed something that would protect um, disabled individuals from discrimination in the workplace. Um, the ADA adopts the definition of disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of such individual or a record of such an impairment or regarded as having such an impairment. Now these are important because we'll talk um, a lot today about substantially limits um, and major life activities because the ADAAA as well as the new regulations, um, the two of them in conjunction, um, have certainly um, broadened these, these two terms. Title I of the ADA 
The A prohibits um, employment discrimination in the workplace against an otherwise qualified individual based on disability by private employers with 15 or more employees. So if you are an employer with 15 or more, you are going to be covered under the ADA. If you are an employer with less than 15, you are more than likely going to be covered under the Iowa Civil Rights Act, which adopts um, all the provisions of the ADA. So um, even if you are smaller than 15, um, this is still going to be relevant to your world, <laughs> unfortunately, I suppose. But um, so you still can pay attention. <laughs> Um, the ADA also imposes reasonable accommodation obligation. Um, employers must engage in an, in an interactive process and provide reasonable accommodation that will allow an employee to perform the essential functions of the position. Accommodation is not reasonable if the employer can demonstrate undue hardship. Again, these are not new. This has been out in the ADA since 1990. Um, and so, although um, the ADAA hasn't gotten rid of these things. They're still there. There certainly has been some, some amendments to these things. Then came the ADAA. It was designed to address a series of decisions by the U United States Supreme Court, which in essence narrowed the definition of disability. I don't know if any of you have been involved in ADA um, litigation before, but I will tell you um, it had been my experience that a lot of the plaintiff's attorneys here in town have basically decided that they weren't going to take any more ADA cases because they couldn't get them through um, the summary judgment stage, basically that middle point where um, we as defendants would go to the court and say, look, this individual is not disabled, they're not substantially limited in a major life activity, and most of the time in recent years the courts agreed with us, including the Supreme Court. Um, there were three cases in 1999, basically, which found that mitigating measures uh, measures must be taken into account when you're determining whether an individual is disabled. Um, just as a simple exam or example, if you had somebody that had um, eyesight problems, um, the court said that you could take into account either contact lenses or glasses, and if you take those into account, then that individual probably was not disabled because they were not substantially limited in a major life activity. Um, then in 2002, a case um, set a higher bar for which it means to have a substantial limitation on major life activity. So these are the cases that um, Congress decided that basically they needed to overturn is <laughs> essentially what they've done. Um, they decided that it was too easy, for lack of a better word, on, on employers to get out of these cases and that there were actually few individuals that were being considered disabled under the ADA, um, which was kind of defeating its whole purpose. So what's the purpose of the new regulations? Um, we have the ADAA, which we got some preview on um, you know, within the past couple years, but the regulations just came out this year uh, back in March and they were effective in May. Um, the purpose of the new regulations um, was basically to implement Title I of the ADA. Again, everything starts with Congress. Um, the focus of Congress, they basically came out and said the primary object of attention in cases brought under the ADA should be whether covered entities, employers, have complied with their obligations and whether discrimination has occurred, not whether the individual meets the definition of disability. So keep this in mind. This is basically, in essence, the new regulations. What it's done is it has broadened, substantially broadened um, the scope of the ADA to the point where um, it's, going to be a, it's going to be difficult to even argue that somebody is not disabled under the ADA. Um, the question of whether an individual meets the definition of disability under this part should not demand extensive analysis. Basically what, the, what Congress is saying is, look, we're not going to spend all our time determining whether an individual is disabled. If they've got an impairment, we want to move on and figure out whether the employer is, is discriminating against them on the basis of that impairment and whether the employer is doing their job by providing them with reasonable accommodations. Um, the findings and purposes make clear that Congress intended to apply a less demanding standard than that applied by the courts and to cover a broad range of individuals. So basically they're going back to those cases and saying, okay, courts, you've narrowed the definition of disability so much that nobody's being covered and people are scared to even bring discrimination claims. Um, we're now going to take that back out. We're going to broaden it. So, um, you know, I guess at this point I'll say be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> they have done that. So. How has the, the definition of disability changed? Well, under the ADAAA, um, the statute sets forth three main prongs under which an individual may be covered by the ADAAA. Um, number one, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the 
major life activity. That's the actual disability prompt. Again, it sounds just like the ADA, and we'll talk a little bit how how that has been changed, not necessarily in the specific wording, but it certainly in practice will be. Um, number two, a record of such an impairment. This is the record of prong. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this today. In fact, not much time at all because it really hasn't changed a lot from what the ADA was. Um, and then number three, being regarded, regarded as having a disability. The regarded as prong. This one, oops, okay. <laughs> I got a note to talk slower. I apologize. That is, <laughs> I'm trying to get through a lot of information today, so I will try to slow down. Um, the regarded as prong has changed um, substantially again um, with the ADAA, so we will talk about that a little bit today, too. So let's get back to Congress's goal, and especially, especially the last part of this goal. The question of whether an individual meets the definition of disability under this part should not demand extensive analysis. So, as I mentioned, um, how did Congress meet this goal through these regulations? Well, neither the, the ADAA nor the new regulations changed the original statutory definition of disability. The wording stayed exactly the same. So, what did Congress do? Well, the new regulations provide rules, what is called rules of construction, for the course to employ for interpreting the term substantially limits. So basically, although they didn't take out substantially limits in the definition, they basically now are telling us with these nine different rules, this is course, this is how you have to interpret it, and this is how we're going to make sure that more individuals are covered. The regulations pull out nine rules of construction that are derived directly from the statute and the legislative history for the statute. The regulations explain how these rules of construction work together to create the result that Congress wanted. It's basically an easier, more streamlined analysis that results in more people being covered under the ADAA. Now I see, I say easier simply because it's going to be easier for the courts to really bypass this part of the process. And they're going to say, okay, that individual has an impairment. Let's talk about whether that individual was discriminated against. So um, I certainly don't mean easier on employers because <laughs> it is not going to be easier for you, unfortunately. So substantially limit. There are nine rules of construction on how the court is, is to interpret the substantially limits. These rules are intended to make it easier to establish coverage under the actual disability prong. And none of the rules provide a definition of the term substantially limits Instead, they basically tell us what the term substantially limit does not require. So rules one through three. Substantially limit is to be construed broadly in favor of expansive coverage and is not meant to be a demanding standard. It's basically, this is taken right out of Congress's goal, Congress's purpose. They wanted, to, they wanted to broaden the definition of disability to include more individuals with coverage under the ADA. Number two, an impairment need not prevent or significantly or severely restrict an individual from performing a major life activity in order to be considered substantially limiting. Nonetheless, not every impairment will constitute a disability. Now, that's easy to say, but I'm going to tell you that in practice, at least so far, and we haven't seen, um, you know, obviously any court cases come down since these were just um, put into place and, and took effect in May. Um, but it's going to be substantially broader as to the individuals that actually get through um, the court system on, under a disability discrimination claim. Whether, number three, whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity should not be the primary object of attention. Again, Congress and now the courts are basically going to pay more attention to what did the employer do once they, they found out that somebody had an impairment or they perceived that somebody had a, an impairment. Um, what types of reasonable accommodations did they offer that individual, or did they not offer any? And if they did not offer any, were they discriminating against the individual because of that impairment? Right? That's the new analysis. Whereas we used to focus under the ADA, we used to focus um, all our attention on whether the individual was, was covered. And like I, I mentioned before, we got a lot of cases thrown out on summary judgment where we didn't even have to go to trial. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be the case anymore. And I'll tell you that those plaintiff's attorneys um, who gave up the ADA a, while, a few years back are chomping at the bit right now. They're, <laughs> they're excited to go back into this because they think now they've got a green card to go straight through. So 
Um, the regulations make it clear the courts are not to get bogged down in whether an impairment is substantially limited. So again, they don't want the courts to focus on whether an individual is disabled or not. If there's an impairment, let's move on. Um, the primary object is whether the discrimination occurred. Rules four and five. Substantially limits should now be interpreted and applied using an individualized assessment that is broader than the standard applied prior to the ADAAA. So you're going to focus on the individual, see what's going on with that individual, and determine whether that individual is substantially limiting. Now, you know, is this a huge change from the ADA? It, you know, I suppose it, it's again broadening um, the spectrum. Um, but I think most of us would focus on the individual at the time anyway. Um, number five, an impairment is a disability if it substantially limits the ability of an individual to perform a major life activity as compared to most people in the, in the general population. This comparison usually will not require scientific, medical, or statistical analysis, but those things may be used where appropriate. So basically, again, the court's saying, look, we don't need any sort of scientific or medical evidence that this individual has an impairment that is substantially limiting. If this individual can show that um, he or she, you know, isn't getting enough sleep at night or is having trouble caring for his or herself, I mean, they're, they're going to move forward in a disability claim fairly quickly. Rule six, except in the cases of ordinary eyeglasses or contact, lens, contact lenses, the determination of whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity is to be made without regard to the ameliorative, I can hardly say the word, or positive effects of mitigating measures. So basically the court's saying, we don't get to take in, or Congress is saying, we don't get to take into account mitigating measures anymore. Um, this is, is significant because like we said, back in 2002, a major court case came down through the U.S. Supreme Court said, that said that we could. So, this rule is basically saying, okay, take out eyeglasses and contact lenses. You can still take those into account. Um, but anything beyond that, you don't get to consider those when determining whether an individual is, um, is disabled or not. So, for example, mitigating measures include medication, metal, medical equipment, low vision devices, um, again, but not ordinary eyeglasses or lenses, prosthetics, hearing aids and cochlear implants, mobility devices, oxygen therapy equipment, assistive technology, learned behavior adaptive neurological modifications, psychotherapy, behavior therapy, or physical therapy. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This, these are just examples. Um, but just be aware that before, when we could say, OK, um, you know, this individual has a prosthetic, so even though he or she is missing um, a limb, they still are able to function as a normal person. They are not um, substantially limited. Well, what they're saying now is take out the prosthetic and see based without the prosthetic where that, whether that individual is able to um, function again as a normal individual without a disability um, or whether that individual is substantially limited. Um, I'm going to tell you that individual is going to be considered to have a disability. Rules 7, 8, and 9. An impairment that is episodic, in remission, or could reoccur is a disability if it would substantially limit a major life activity when it's active. So the best example, um, an individual has cancer, has had treatment, has responded to the treatment, that individual is still going to be disabled because maybe that individual is able to come back to work and, and function normally since they've had the treatment. Um, but it's still, going to be, it's still going to be considered a disability under these new regulations. An impairment that substantially limits one major life activity not, need not substantially limit other major life activities in order to be considered a substantially limiting impairment. Now basically a plaintiff just needs to show that, look, um, I'm having trouble sleeping at night, I'm having trouble caring for myself. I mean, it just has to be one major life activity. Um, and, and again, this is, this is substantially broadening the ability of plaintiffs to get through the court system um, on a disability discrimination case. The effects of impairment lasting or expected to last fewer than six months can be substantially limiting. However, short-term illnesses lasting only a few days or weeks are likely not substantially limiting. So again, we have this under the ADA too. If you've got the flu, you're likely still not going to be considered to be disabled. But if you have something that's lasting six months or more, 
um, some sort of mental or physical impairment that's lasting six months or more, um, you are much more likely and very probably going to be considered um, as having a disability under the ADA. Those were the nine rules of, of construction and hopefully um, those kind of give you an overview of how, as to how um, Congress and the EEOC has broadened this definition of disability um, so that there is more coverage for individuals under the Act. Um, so what are some more significant changes under the new ADAAA? They brought in something that's called predictable assessment. Um, basically, the principles set out in the nine rules of construction are intended to provide for more generous coverage and the application of the ADA's prohibition on discrimination through a framework that is predictable, consistent, and workable for all individuals. Although the regulations repeatedly refer to employers' obligation to engage in an individualized assessment of each employee, um, despite that, they're now saying, okay, yes, you need to engage in this individualized assessment, but we have these predictable assessments that in virtually, quote unquote, all cases will result in a finding that the employee qualified for protection under the ADAA. Basically what it means is we have these certain impairments that Congress and the, and the EEO, EEOC has said, okay, if you have this, 99% of the time you're going to be considered to be impaired under the ADAA and you're going to have coverage. Given the, their inherent nature, these types of impairments will, as a factual matter, virtually always be found to impose a substantial limitation on a major life activity. So what are the hosts? those predictable assessments. Here are some examples. And, and to be honest with you, most of these are probably, you know, what you would consider anyway. Um, but now they're they're out there in the regs and, and basically Congress is saying, okay, courts, really, you have to spend almost zero time on um, these type of impairments to determine whether or not um, they're going to fall under the, the ADA and the ADAA. So the example, um, deafness. Um, obviously, an individual who is deaf is substantially limiting in their ability to hear. Blindness, same thing, substantially limiting in their ability to see. Um, intellectual disabilities um, substantially limits brain function. I will tell you that intellectual disability is really a new um, phrase for mental retardation, mental handicap. That's basically what they're, what they're talking about here. Um, missing limbs, again, you don't get to take into account a prosthetic. Um, so they're going to be substantially limited in their muscu muscular skeletal function. Um, cancer, almost always is going to be considered a disability under the new regs. Um, substantially limited in their normal cell growth. Um, cerebral palsy, again, substantially limited in brain function. Um, diabetes, um, substantially limits endocrine function. Epilepsy, substantially limits neurological function. HIV substantially limits immune function. Multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, substantially both substantially limit neurological function. Um, major depressive disorder substantially limits brain function. Now this is an interesting one because there were um, back in the day debates under the ADA whether um, depression um, was substantially limiting because you have individuals who you know may be depressed one day. Um, but the next day they're they're on a high and they're okay. And so there was a lot of um, core activity on, as to whether depression actually would fall under the ADA. Um, and in some cases, it, it you know the courts found that yes, it did. In some cases, the courts found that it did not. And again, it was an individualized assessment. Here they're saying major de depressive disorder is going to be a predictable assessment. And so basically, it is going to fall under the ADA. Um, but you know it will be it'll be interesting to see what major depressive disorder means. Um, you know whether that's somebody who suffers a depression um, episodically. I don't know. We'll we'll have to see how the courts end up interpreting that. Um, bipolar disorder it substantially limits brain function. Post traumatic stress disorder substantially limits brain function. Um, this in, this one is getting bigger and bigger. Basically based on the fact that we have we have troops coming back all the time, um, troops that are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, I, I would guess that this is going to be a popular one in the courts in the days to come. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, I, I laugh about this one. It's not really very funny, but I tease my mom all the time about how she has obsessive compulsive disorder. And I never really considered that, 
that I was telling her that she had a disability, but um, the courts are going to interpret that as being a disability. It, it substantially limits brain function. Um, I suppose I shouldn't stop teasing her about that. <laughs> um, schizophrenia um, also substantially limits brain function. So those are basically um, some examples of, of what the regulations are calling predictable assessments. They're saying that if you see this, um, there really is no need to do the analysis as to whether the individual has an impairment that falls under the ADA or the ADAAA. Um, the, the, the rights are basically saying, you know, to the extent you, you need to do that assessment, go ahead and do it, but really you're going to have an obligation to provide reasonable accommodations to individuals that have um, these predictable assessment type impairments. So what other, what else did they do to the, to the ADA? Um, they did broaden the list of major lack activities. They didn't actually change the definition or provide a specific definition, um, but they certainly did broaden the list. Um, the regulations revoked the rule that a major lack activity must be of central importance to most people's daily lives, but they do not provide a specific definition. Um, instead, the final regulations offer a non-exhaustive list to describe what constitutes a major life activity. Um, the list that they provide included caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, communicating, concentrating, thinking. Okay. <laughs> I thought there were more, but there weren't. Um, so those are those are your examples, and um, and I don't think that's all of them that they included in the in the regulations, but it is it is part of the list. Um, the regulations also provide that major life activities include major bodily functions. This is new. They did not have this in there under the ADA. Um, these include your circulatory and immune systems, um, your special sense organs, um, and skin, normal cell growth, and respiratory, lymphatic, or reproductive functions. So these are basically your, what your body does every day. If there is an impairment that limits these bodily functions, they are going to be considered disabled under the ADA. The operations of the individual organs and systems also are included under the new regulations, such as the heart, liver, or lungs are also considered major bodily functions. So an example of that, um, if an individual has high cholesterol that's, that's causing heart problems or is, um, where they have to be treated for some sort of heart disease, um, that's going to be considered disabled under the ADA. So let's talk about the major life activity of working. Um, I remember back when the, the discrimination cases first became very popular under the ADA, um, a lot of plaintiffs would say, well, this prohibits me from, from working as a normal individual, so I'm, I'm substantially limited in my ability to work. And that was a big, that was one of the bigger uh, major life activities that they would use. Um, the final regulations don't alter the definition of working as a major life activity. Um, basically, they say and they reemphasize that being substantially limited in performing one specific job does not make a person substantially limited in working. But if a person is substantially limited in the class of jobs, that person is covered under the actual disability prong of the ADAAA. I think it's hard to say. I'm going to Yeah. Um, a class of jobs can be determined by reference to the nature of the work that an individual is limited in performing or by reference to job-related requirements. Um, for example, if there's a requirement that um, the individual do heavy lifting or pro prolonged standing, um, if they're unable to do those type of things in a class of jobs, they're going to be substantially limited in a major life activity. Now, the regarded as prong, the third prong of the ADAAA. Um, it underwent substantial changes with the new regulations as well. Um, like the actual disability prong, the final regulations make it easier for individuals to establish that they are disabled because they are regarded as having a disability. Um, under the regulations, an individual will be regarded as disabled if he or she is subje subjected to an, act an action prohibited by the ADA because of an actual or perceived impairment, whether or not the impairment limits or is perceived to limit a major life activity. Thus, uh, under the regulations, an individual will be covered by the ADA even if he or she cannot show that the employer perceived him to be substantially limited in a major life activity, so long as he or she can show that the employer took action against
against him or her because of an actual or perceived physical or mental impairment. Basically what this does is this takes out completely in the regarded as prong the concepts of substantially limited and major life activity. They are absolutely no longer relevant in evaluating whether or not an individual is covered under the regarded as prong of the ADAAA. Um, this analysis is now solely confined to whether the employer treated the individual differently as a result of his or her assumed impairment. Um, so basically what this does is it shows that the, an individual, if they for some reason feel like they can't get through under an actual impairment or an actual disability prong, they may be able to use the regarded as prong if an employer actually took action against them, if they were fired, if they were um, refused to hire, if they were demoted, um, any of those actions will give them a possible claim under the regarded as prong. Action is key under the regarded as. Practically speaking, an employee suing under the regarded as prong need only show that he or she had an actual or perceived disability and that the employer discriminated against the employee because of that perception. Basically that the employer took action against that employee based on the actual or perceived disability. For example, if an employer refused to hire an applicant because of skin graft scars, the employer has regarded the applicant as an individual with a disability. If an employer terminates an employee because of cancer, the employer has regarded the individual as an individual with a disability. Um, an employer who terminates an employee with angina from a manufacturing job that requires the employee work around machinery believing that the employee will pose a safety risk to himself or others if he were to suddenly lose consciousness has regarded the individual as an individual with a disability. Whether the employer then has a defense as to um, that the employee poses a direct threat, that's a whole other analysis. That <laughs> that you would go into if you were opposed with that type of um, lawsuit or litigation or claim. Trans transitory and minor. Under the new regulations, an employer may defend against a claim that an employee was regarded as disabled by showing that the impairment is, in the case of an actual impairment, or would be, in the case of a perceived impairment, transitory and minor. So what does that mean? Um, this gives the employer a defense. Transitory is defined in the regulations as lasting or expecting to last um, six months or less. And minor is, is minor. They don't really put a new, a new definition in there, but um, you know, I think most of us can, can figure out what minor means. Um, an impairment that, is, that may last for six months or less, but is not minor is covered. So again, it's showing that, that the defense it has to be transitory and minor. It can't be one or the other. Um, if it is only one or the other, then there's not going to be the defense. Same thing here. An impairment that is minor but will last for more than six months is covered. Um, this is an objective standard. An employer must show that an actual impairment is objectively transitory and minor or that a perceived impairment would, would objectively be transitory and minor if it were real. Um, an employer's subjective belief is irrelevant. Um, again, it's, it's tough when we start talking about objective versus subjective standard, um, and that's what the court's going to apply, it's an objective standard, um, and, you know, I'd be really wealthy if I could tell you exactly what that meant, but it is, it'll be interesting to see how the courts interpret this. Prohibited action. The regarded as requires a prohibited action in order for an individual to bring a claim under the regarded as prong of the ADAAA, there has to be some sort of prohibited action of the employer. Um, prohibited action includes refusal to hire. Again, you know, beware. This could include um, applicants that have come to you and said, you know, I want to, I want to come work for you. I want this job. You do the interview. If you refuse to hire them because they have an actual or a perceived disability, um, you're going to face some consequences under the ADAAA. Um, demotion, placement on involuntary leave, termination, exclusion for, for failure to meet a qualification standard, uh, harassment, denial of any other term, condition, or privilege of employment. Um, an, an employer may not discriminate. Again, we're talking about the regarded as prong, and if employer takes 
these actions um, against an individual with either an actual or perceived impairment, um, they're going to face some liability under the ADAA, under the regarded as prong. Um, recruitment, advertising, and job application procedures, hiring, upgrading, promotion, award of tenure, demotion, transfer, layoff, termination, right of return from layoff, and rehiring, rates of pay or other forms of compensation, job assignments, job classifications, organizational stru structures, position descriptions, lines of progression, all these things. Basically what they're saying in the regs is you don't get to take into account either an impairment or a perceived impairment when you're deciding or determining these things. Um, and if you do, you're going to face liability under the ADAAA. The regarded as prong also requires causation. First, there has to be a prohibited employment action under the ADA. So any of those things that we just talked about, um, probably the, the easiest example is termination. Um, second, there needs to be a causal relationship between the physical and me mental impairment that, by the way, can't be transitory and minor, and the prohibited employment action. There needs to be a causal relationship between um, the fact that you terminated the employee and the fact that the employee has an actual or perceived disability. Um, you, ne you need some reason to believe that the covered entity, the employer, took the discriminatory action because of the individual's physical or mental impairment or perceived physical or mental impairment. Reasonable accommodations. This is one bonus. <laughs> Individuals who are regarded as having a disability by their employers are not thereby entitled to reasonable accommodation. It's really hard to, to accommodate just a perceived disability. If the individual only has a perceived disability, there's really nothing to accommodate. So the reasonable accommodations do not come into play with the um, regarded as prong of the ADAA. So kind of uh, in summary of what we talked about so far, so what do these crazy regulations mean for employers? Well, first and, and foremost, you know, I'll, I'll tell you to buckle down because there's going to be more claims. Um, like I said, we have a lot of um, plaintiffs attorneys here in Des Moines that for a long time had decided that they're, they're no longer going to bring these claims under the ADA, that it wasn't worth doing because they spent tons of money to get them in um, just for the court to throw them out on the summary judgment stage before they ever get before a jury. Um, that's not going to be the case anymore. Um, these cases, I would say that the majority of them, based on these new regulations, if the, if the courts interpret them as they're supposed to, um, the majority of the cases are going to end up either in trial or settling before trial. Uh, because it's more likely than not that an individual is going to be perceived to have a disability or is going to have a disability under the ADAAA. The primary impact of the new regulations is that employers' ability to defend disability discrimination claims will no longer focus on intent, as intently on whether an individual is covered under the ADAAA. What will happen is the defense will then focus on, um, okay, yes, this individual was disabled under the act, but we provided the individual with reasonable accommodations, but they were still unable to perform the essential functions of the job. Or this individual um, posed a direct threat to the other employees in our workplace. Or um, providing this reasonable accommodations that this individual needed was, a, was an undue hardship on the employer. So we're actually going to get to those types of analysis that, frankly, before, when we were just under the ADA, we didn't even get to most of the time because most of these cases stopped at whether the individual was covered, a covered individual under the act. Um, and said cases will focus on whether the employee and employer properly engaged in the interactive process and whether a reasonable accommodation was provided and if not, why? And that's when your undue hardship claim is going to come into play. Um, it's more important now than it ever has been under the ADA to bring out that interactive process. If you think that you have somebody that may be disability disabled under the ADA or the ADAAA, you want to have that interactive process with them to determine whether or not that individual can be accommodated and whether or not the individual can perform the essential functions of the job with or without accommodation. Employers still under the new regulations will continue to maintain the burden of proving an undue hardship. Again, um, before this was always out there, but it wasn't a huge deal because we very rarely had to get there. Um, most of the time, we can defend on the basis of the individual was not was not disabled under the act. Um, 
we're going to get there now. These are the things that we're going to have to start taking into consideration. Um, it's going to be it's going to be you as the company, you as the employers, that are going to have to show um, that the reasonable accommodation that the employee suggested or asked for um, is it was an undue hardship on the company, and the, the company could not provide that reasonable accommodation. Employers should revisit their disability-related policies and procedures, and also job descriptions to ensure that they are that they adequately address the new standards set forth in the regs. Um, I added job descriptions in here because um, probably even more so than before, um, you're going to have to determine the essential functions of the job. Um, and job descriptions are going to be up front and first and foremost in determining those essential functions. So you want to make sure that those are clear, concise, and that they accurately ref reflect what the essential functions of each specific job are, um, and frankly, that they're up to date. All managers and human resources professional professionals need to be trained on the AD. AAA and the new regulations to ensure understanding and compliance with the new regulatory regime. Um, a lot of what this training will focus on is the fact that, okay, don't spend all your time worrying about or determining whether this individual has an impairment that would be covered under the, the, um, the new act. You want to spend your time in that interactive process and trying to reasonably accommodate that individual. Employers must be particularly mindful of the employer's obligation to engage in the interactive process to determine what, if any, accommodations the employer can provide. Again, it's shifting from your initial analysis, whether the individual is covered under the act, to what, what reasonable accommodations can we provide this individual, because we're frankly, in a lot of cases, going to assume that the individual is going to be covered under the act. There are a number of impairments that will, that will virtually always be disabilities, and we went through most of those, um, and you're going you're gonna, to, I mean, common sense is going to dictate that too. You're going to know um, something, you know, for example, the, the deaf or the blind, blindness is going to fall within the ADA. There's not going to be a lot of questions asked on those. Um, again, your, your analysis is then going to shift to what reasonable accommodations can we provide to that employee to help them perform the essential functions of the job. The final regulations provide um, examples of a number of impairments that should easily be concluded to be disabilities, thus streamlining the analysis. Then, I do want to touch on, we're almost done, <laughs> okay, because we're almost out of time too, but I did have, we got a question um, before the presentation about wellness, wellness programs. Um, I know that wellness programs are very, very popular right now with employers, and we got a question as to how the new regulations and the ADAAA can affect wellness programs. Um, unfortunately, that's not a simple answer. <laughs> and so it's not something that I can say, oh, they're not going to, but um, unfortunately, they are going to. Um, you know, the ADA issues that arise in the context of wellness program basically are threefold. Um, number one, the employer's obligation to provide reasonable accommodation to disabled employees in order to ensure um, that employs participation in the program. So your, your reasonable accommodation here, your reasonable accommodation obligation is going to extend to these wellness programs um, so that you can help the employee participate in that program. Um, number two, the ADA's prohibition against medical inquiries and examinations in certain circumstances. Um, typically with wellness programs, employers are doing health risk assessments, um, either at the beginning or during the wellness program. Um, and, you know, a question becomes, how does the regulations in the ADAA affect those? And then thirdly, the pro prohibition under the ADA against, against adverse employment actions on the basis of a person's actual or perceived disability. Again, keep in mind that the new regulations substantially broadened who's covered under, um, under the Act. So, so, in regards to number one, the reasonable accommodation, Basically, if a bona fide wellness program of an employer conditions a reward on a health factor that, it, that a disabled employee cannot achieve, um, just kind of an example of that, lowering cholesterol or lifting a certain amount of, work, of weight, um, the employer must comply with the ADA's reasonable accommodation requirements, which basically means that you need to engage in an interactive um, process with that employee to determine whether you can accommodate them to help them participate 
and satisfy the goals of the wellness program. So your reasonable accommodation obligations are going to also extend to your wellness program. Um, the medical inquiries and examinations, they get a little more um, extensive. Um, under the ADA, employers are prohibited from requiring an employee to take a medical examination um, and from inquiring whether the employee has a disability or as to the nature or severity of a disability unless the examination or inquiry is job related and consistent with business necessity. Now these are talking about current employees. Um, you know, obviously the ADA um, allows medical examinations, post uh, um, offer medical examinations as long as um, all the offerees are required to take them um, and as, as long as there is a business necessity. The, the new regulations have not changed that um, and nor have they changed the prohibition under the ADA um, that, that says that basically employees can't, um, can't um, inquire about disabilities or the nature of severity of disabilities for current employees um, unless it is job related. Um, now the ADA does make an exception for examinations or inquiries made as a part of a voluntary wellness program. Um, provided that medical records obtained are maintained in a confidential manner and not used for the purpose of limit, limiting health insurance eligibility or, um, you know, for a discriminatory purpose. Um, because the ADAAA broadens the definition of disability, um, these health risk assessments, which are typically used with wellness programs, are now more likely to make impermissible um, disabilities related inquiries than before because basically now you're going to have more individuals that are going to be covered on the, under the Act and so your chances of asking inappropriate disability related questions are going to increase substantially um, and so it's going to make it more interesting. I think probably what you're going to want to do is revisit um, the type of inquiries that are made with your HRAs, your health risk assessment and see whether they're going to comply with the new regulations or whether um, there, there's a chance that they're going to um, be a violation of the new regulations. Um, this, this concept of voluntary participation um, is also under debate. Um, the EEOC, um, a question, basically they've issued enforcement guidance that says a question or examination is voluntary as long as the employer neither requires participation nor penalizes employees who do not participate. Um, the EEOC's interpretation of voluntary is strict and may even preclude awards for participating in an HRA. Um, in 2009, in March of 2009, the EEOC actually withdrew an opinion letter that, that stated that an HRA administered as a part of a wellness program that met the requirements of HIPAA and that did not exceed the 20% of the employee's premium payment would not violate the ADA. They withdrew that opinion. Mm -hmm. um, the new opinion letter opines that conditional on an employee's right to receive health insurance are participating in an HRA is not, makes it not voluntary and not job related or consistent with business necessity and thus it violates the ADA. So, <laughs> now is there something that can be said for the way you phrase Absolutely. the benefit. Absolutely. So it's all in the verbiage. It's, it's going to be in the verbiage. The carrot versus the stick, well, right? Well, it's going to be in, it's going to come down to a lot in what what you ask and what types of questions you ask because it's not going to violate the ADA unless you're getting into disability related inquiries. And so, um, you know, wellness programs, although, you know, obviously they're very popular right now, um, you know, they're, they're going to be a little bit of a sticky situation uh, for a while to see how they play out with these new regulations. I wish I had um, a definitive answer for you on that, but I don't. It's good. We're going to have to kind of wait and see how the courts interpret them and, frankly, how the EEOC continues to, to interpret them. Um, but you do want them to be um, voluntary if you can make them, and the EEOC um, is, is making that much more difficult to show that they all are voluntary. Got it. I see we've got a question here. Uh, Lori asks, do I understand correctly, if we are aware of an employee who has a disability, we should engage in the interactive process regardless of whether or not uh, the accommodation we need to engage in the interactive process? Mm -hmm. um, in this part of that. I don't, you've got an example in here, an employee who is bipolar and made us aware of the struggles in some of 
his interactions with others. No request for accommodation. We need to engage in the interactive. Do we need to engage in the interactive process? Um, I will tell you that um, if things are going okay and he doesn't request accommodations, then no, I don't think you do. Um, you know, the employee still, um, and again, this is something that hasn't been played out in the courts, but an employee still doesn't have, does have an obligation to request reasonable accommodation. Now, the fact that you're aware of this disability, and frankly, it's going to be a disability under the ADA, it's one of those um, predictable assessments. Um, and you know that this employee um, struggles in certain, certain circumstances, then I think probably it's a good idea to go ahead and have a conversation with this employee and just say, you know, you've made us aware of this, of this issue. Um, and just, you know, just tread lightly and say, you've made us aware of this issue. What can we do to help? We've noticed that you've had problems in this specific circumstance or in some of these circumstances. What can we do to help? Um, whether that's eliminate um, you know, certain communications with other employees or, you know, what the best um, accommodation is, I, I, you know, I don't know. That's something that you can, you can sit down with the employee and try to, try to find out um, what's going on. Um, so I don't think it's an absolute that if you're aware that an employee has a disability, that that employee is actually functioning fine, everything is going well, then no, I don't think you have to give them reasonable accommodations. Um, that obligation on the employee to ask is still there. But if you are or you do become aware of problem, aware of problems, I would go ahead and just you know sit down with the employee and, and make it clear to them that you're you're there to help. You're not trying to separate them or discriminate against them in any way. You're trying to make their workplace better for them. Great. Any other questions that anybody has? Uh, this is I don't know what your billable hours are, but. <laughs> I can imagine that asking the questions right now would be a little less expensive. It, it's a little less expensive, yes. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you that um, I do take emails most of the time without charging because I forget to write them down. <laughs> so that's a little perfect. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Another question that I have in this age of litigation and all of these constantly changing uh, regulations, is there a website, a resource? you would say is a, a must-go-to uh, mm -hmm. resource for these folks to, to keep? You mean other than the Brown Wooded? <laughs> other than the Brown Wooded firm. <laughs> sure. sure. No, um, probably your best resources, uh, not only with the ADA, but we'll, most of your employment loss is going to be the Department of Labor. Um, and it's, I think it's DOL.gov is, is what the actual website is, and I, I can check that for sure. But um, that's going to be your, your best plan. Also here in Iowa, the Iowa Civil Rights Commission has a website that has some information on it. Um, Iowa Workforce Development, um, and then the, then the EEOC. Um, but in my experience, probably the most um, helpful is is the Department of Labor's website. They will cover almost all of this stuff. Um, there's a website out there also that I use sometimes um, when I'm in a hurry and I need to think, okay, the ADA covers employers with 15 or more, um, the ADEA is 20 or more, you know, the little things like that when I need to, okay, quick, find out. There is a website, and I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can send it to you and maybe that would be great. send it to the participants. Yep. And it's we'll very helpful. It has um, a lot of articles written by employers all over the country, basically. Searchable by topic? Okay. Absolutely. Perfect. So that one's probably going to be even a little more helpful. Then the DOL, I mean, the DOL website is awesome, but it's very um, concise and very strict on, okay, this is, we're the DOL. This is, of course, how we're going to right. enforce these things. Um, this other website provides more court opinions, how things are interpreted, that type of thing. So I will get back to you when I get back to the office. Fantastic. And the other question that we had, uh, Amy asks if you have any supporting notes regarding the wellness question. Absolutely. We'll I also do. also forward that. Um, yeah, I did uh, quite a bit of research research um, before I did this today just because so, I wanted to be you know make sure that we were up to date too and um, so I will I will put that in the outline form and send that as well fantastic um, and oh Rob says this is great they can post everything they get at my intranet including the links and documents and put it on the my intranet site as well okay so we'll make sure that we offer that link mm -hmm. to anybody that provided your email address and if anybody that didn't provide their email address, um, there will be a survey at the end of this presentation, and there will be an opportunity for you to 
uh, put your email address in there so we can use that also to get back to you with this additional information. Uh, Cynthia asked the question, is this webinar being recorded for repeat viewing? Absolutely, and it's stored in multiple places. ABI has a repository for the webinar, uh, webinars that we're doing monthly, and also my Entranet keeps them on there. So uh, that's great. You've got them sort of in two places. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to just really briefly update you all on some events that might support uh, some of the questions that are being asked here. As you all know, healthcare reform is, you know, top of mind, constantly changing and evolving. And we've got just a rock star group of individuals. We've got four individuals that have been working on this topic since healthcare reform was passed, what, almost a year and a half ago. And as rules are built, uh, we're communicating those rules out to the membership. Uh, we've got several tools available for that. We've got a tab on our website that specifically addresses healthcare reform issues, and all of our articles are posted there. We've got an e-newsletter that goes out monthly, and it is definitely driven by what's going on at that moment. So it's, it's current, and it's the most pressing uh, topics regarding that. Uh, also, uh, I think this will be our fifth time we've done it, ABI is hosting an informal health healthcare reform Q&A, and it's about 15 minutes of, these are some pertinent updates that you might need for, uh, you know, your day-to-day -day operation, but then what we like to do is turn it completely over to facilitated Q&A. So that's an opportunity to bring those questions. The next one that is coming up is at Park Place Event Center in Cedar Falls on July 20th. So July 20th, Cedar Falls, I believe, is it over the lunch hour or is it? 9 to 11. It's from 9 to 11. So from 9 to 11 on July 20th. So put that on your calendar and uh, make sure you're in attendance for that. And again, uh, the information that you receive there is we've got it based on uh, disciplines. So there's tax information. We've got a CPA that'll be there. We've got an HR professional. So someone actually do doing HR will be there to help with that. And then Alice Helley with Brown Winnick, who is just a celebrity on the healthcare She's reform fabulous. topic in Iowa, uh, will be present for that as well. So come with your questions uh, and be there for that. Some other upcoming events within ABI, we've got our Executive Open Golf Outing, uh, one of the best golf outings in the state. Uh, if you are a business leader in the state, do not miss that. It's September 15th. And it's at the Harvester, which is in Rhodes, Iowa, on the way to Marshalltown. And then we've got our manufacturing luncheon that is happening October 18th. And this is, if you're in manufacturing, it's going to be uh, some economic forecasting. We've got Mary Andringa uh, coming in from, she is uh, currently president of the National Association of Manufacturers. And she will be giving us a national update on manufacturing. And then we've got uh, Tom Latham, who will be there, and then a fabulous panel of Iowa manufacturers and sort of some of the trends that we're seeing in the state of Iowa. That's, again, October 18th here in Des Moines at Ramada Tropics Resort. And uh, that is about all we have for announcements. Again, I want to thank Holly and Rob and Maureen and everybody at My Entranet. And, Danny, thank you so much for giving us your time and your wonderful preparation for that. And her contact information is right there in front of you. And again, you might want to shoot her an email if you have specific <laughs> questions Absolutely. because she'd be glad to help you out with Absolutely. those. Absolutely. Uh, wanted to also mention that next month's topic is partnership and what it means to business owners and residents of Iowa. That's presented by Rhonda Vry Bills and she's a long-term care strategies uh, professional. So again, that is July 27th at 9 a.m. So thank you for being here, and we'll see you again next